Good morning and happy Sabbath. Before we, we start our Bible study for this morning, let me invite all of you to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, my Lord, today is your day. It's a day when we remember that you are our creator and also that you are our redeemer. Father, as we come before you during this time to open your word, we believe and understand that by studying your word, Father, our faith will grow. And also believe, Lord, we believe that you have given us a special and unique message to be shared to the world. And today, Father, we want to share that message. But I want to ask you something, Lord, that may be your words that go forth to the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wulara, in the world, and to everybody, Lord, who is watching this program. May you bless each one of us, Father, as we open your holy word. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray. Amen. There is a particular and unique message entrusted by God to a particular movement and we believe that the Seventh-day Adventist movement is the movement that the Lord has chosen to entrust a unique message to be delivered to the world today. This is how we call the present truth. That message is recorded there in the Word of God in the book of Revelations chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. It is not my purpose to go through the whole um, message in there that is divided in three. We call them the three angels' messages. We need more than 30 minutes to go through these three angels' messages today. I'll be focusing only on the third last message on one particular aspect that it is the core and the center of the whole three angels' messages, and in particular, the core of the third angels' message. And I'll be using a lot of Bible verses. Therefore, let me invite all of you to bring your Bible, a pen, a piece of paper, because this is a Bible study. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, need to know this message. Because if we exist, we exist for a particular purpose, for the purpose of sharing this particular message in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. There are many other messages that, are, that we, sh we, we, we are in, have in common with other denominations. But this one is the message the Lord has entrusted us as Seventh-day Adventists to be able to share to the entire world now, today, as we live in this time of history. Let me invite you to open your Bibles in Revelations chapter um, 14, verses 6 to 12. I am not going to read the whole, the whole verses in here, but I'll mention quickly. Um, it's my intention that at the end of the sermon, if, if um, God allows me to give give me a little bit of time to explain more about the other messages. I'll be using prophetic, a prophetic chart to explain that. However, quickly, the first message is recorded there in verse 7. But before that, if you notice in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, it says that another angel was flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to be preached to everybody. It is the everlasting gospel of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us and his job on the cross and his job nowadays on the heavenly sanctuary that constitute the everlasting gospel, which is the foundation for these three messages. Then verse 7 says the first angel comes and invites people to do three particular things. These messages in Revelation 14, 6 to 12 is the last warning of God to humanity, is the last call of a loving God who wants to save everybody, a loving God who is interested in the salvation of every single human being. 
And before he comes, he is saying, please listen to this last warning so you don't lose your salvation. So the first angel says, basically, fear God, give glory to him, and worship him. Fear God, give glory to him, and worship him. It would take us longer to explain all of this. But basically, this is what the angel is saying to humanity. Please, fear God. And fear God is respecting, acknowledging God. But also, if you go, you can read this later, in Proverbs 8, chapter 8, verse 13, clearly says that the fearing of God is hating sin or disliking sin or disliking evil. It takes you to another level. So the angel is saying, please, fear God, dislike sin, give glory to him, and worship him. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. I'll go back, I'll come back to this later on. And then we hear and we read the second angel in verse 8 saying, and another angel followed. Notice that it is one angel coming and delivering the message, and then the second follows that. It's a consecutive message given to humanity from the Lord. And the second angel basically is saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Now, it would take us longer to explain that, but basically the second angel is saying, please, do not compromise your faith. Do not mix true and error. Do not be lukewarm. And this is the message for the people of God and for everybody who wants to hear this last warning. First angel is saying, fear God, respect God, love God, hate sin, worship him, give glory to him. And then the second angel is saying, do not compromise in your faith. Be faithful to the Lord no matter what. And then we come to the third angel's message, and I'll be focusing particularly on this third angel's message this morning. And it goes, we can read that in verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, and then... You can read verses 10 and 11 later because this, what is described in verses 10 and 11 is the consequences of receiving the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Who is the beast? What is the image? A lot of things in this third angel's message. But the point for this morning is that when we receive the sealing of God, when we are sealed by God, and then by default, we will not receive the mark of the beast. So rather than focusing on the mark of the beast in itself, and God willing will be able to touch this later, we must focus upon the sealing of God. And once we receive the sealing of God, and then basically we will not have the mark of the beast, and we will not experience the punishment described there in verses 10 and 11 of Revelation 14. Now, please, focus on verse 12, would be the center of the message for today. Revelation 6, verse 12 says, sorry, 14, verse 12 says in there, here is the patient of the saints. The saints, the faithful people of God who endure persecution in the past. The saints are the ones who give ear to the first angel's message and to the second. The patients in here are the ones who fear God, are the ones who worship God, and are the ones who give glory to God, and are the ones who do not compromise their faith. This or those are the saints. But let me, let me show you the beautiful characteristics of those saints. Verse 12, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep two beautiful things in here, 
to keep, number one, the commandments of God, and number two, the faith of Jesus. It's much easier to understand which are the commandments of God. We can go to Genesis chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we'll see the commandments of God there clearly. But then, then the question this morning is, what is the faith of Jesus? And how the faith of Jesus relates to the commandments of God and relates to the first and the second angel's message. And how this is vital for us to understand if we are serious, if we are honest and open in our relationship with God and we, if we really, really want to be in heaven with the Lord. The faith of Jesus. In order to understand that, please, Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, and verse 16. So you got your Bibles with you, Galatians, chapter 2. Chapter 6, and, sorry, chapter 2, and verse 16. And actually, we'll be reading this from the King James, because the translation in the King James Version is the most accurate one, at least in this particular verse. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified. And I was looking in the, in, the, in the dictionary for another word for being justified, so we can have a better idea. And I found another word that I can use in here. I can read in this way, knowing that a man is not excused from the condemnation of, of, of sin. So knowing that a man is not excused, not um, justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Clearly, the Bible says in here that we are justified, we are excused, we are exonerated by the faith of Jesus Christ. The same faith that we have read in Revelation 14, 12. Now, let's go to Romans 5, na, 5 verses 5, um, sorry, chapter 5, verse 9. So Romans chapter 5, verse 9 reads, Much more than having now been justified, been excused, been exonerated, by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans says that we are justified by the blood of Jesus. And Galatians says that we are justified by the faith of Jesus. You notice that the faith of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, which is, which is uh, understood in his sacrifice for us, came to be the same thing. So basically, basically we see in here that we are justified, we are excused and exonerated and declared not guilty by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us, by his precious blood, by his faith. And the faith of Jesus is none other than the perfection, the righteousness, the holiness, the faithfulness of Jesus. Because only a sinner deserves to die. As the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But we notice that a righteous man, a faithful man, a holy and perfect man like Jesus was crucified on the cross on behalf of the sins of the world. Now let me, let me now take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And I pray that you are following me 
as we study the Bible together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin. Notice that God made Jesus to be sin. Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God made Jesus to be sin. God made a righteous Jesus. And righteous can be also understood by doing the right thing. Somebody who is righteous is somebody who does always does the right thing. So God made perfect, holy, righteous Jesus to be sin so he can die on the cross for us. But I want you to, to get this particular aspect. The perfection of Jesus, his righteousness, his holiness is available for you and for me. And the key for the faith of Jesus comes here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. And as we go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, let's remember what Revelation 14, 12 said previously. And I read, I read it again when it says, here the patience of the saints, here are those who keep, keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus, understanding that the faith of Jesus is his righteous life, his perfect life, his precious life holy and pure blood that has been given for all of us. A righteous man dying on the cross as if he was a sinner. Now, I was looking in the dictionary for another word for keep, and I found these beautiful words, keep, have, possess, retain. And when you read Revelation 14, 12, using those words gives us, gives us a different meaning. Let me read it using those words. Here are those who have. Here are those who possess, who retain the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. So if you notice, in here the invitation and the calling in the third angel's message is that Humans, all of us, can possess, can have in us these two characteristics, the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. The commandments of God not being just on a book, on a piece of paper, but in us. And also the faith of Jesus not just being a theory, but in us. Now, how these things can happen? And before we go to Colossians, something came to my mind here. And let me, let me invite you to go to Jeremiah 31, 33, to notice the intentions of God since the Old Testament that the commandments of God be not just on the paper, but be somewhere else, that gives us the idea of something personal, something that we possess, something that we have. Jeremiah chapter 31. Um, Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll be reading um, only verse 33, 33 sorry, because there's, there's other beautiful verses in there that we can read. Jeremiah 31, 33 um, says... But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
And notice this precious covenant, precious covenant between God and his people. He says, I will put my law, my commandments in their minds here and write it in their hearts and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. It is the desire of our God that his commandments be here in our minds, be internalized in our minds, and also be in our hearts. So whatever decisions we make, be according to the commandments of God. Whatever actions, whatever feelings, whatever emotions that we express, be according to the law of God. This is the intention of God in the Old Testament. But notice, the same intention of God in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. If we go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, the post to um, Paul here in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 mentions this. 10, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16. This, Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I'll write them. Beautifully how the author of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah and bringing that to the New Testament and saying to all of us believers who live in the New Testament era, that the same idea that the Lord wanted for his people in the past is the same that God wants for us, that his laws can be in us. And therefore, it makes sense what John says in Revelation 14, 12, that those who have, those who possess, those who keep those commandments in their minds, in their hearts, are the ones who are the saints are the ones who are listening to the warnings of the first and the second angel's message. But how about the faith of Jesus? And now, please, let's go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. I pray that you'll be writing these verses there, because my brothers and sisters, if we are called to be Seventh-day Adventists, we must know this because this is the message that the Lord has entrusted us as a movement, as a people to be able to share to humanity nowadays, today. And this is what makes us dis distinctive than the other denominations. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. To them, says the Apostle Paul here, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And, and Paul talks about this mystery in other verses as well. But what is that mystery? This mystery among the Gentiles, and then Paul's cl Paul clearly tells us, which is Christ in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. The only hope that we have in order to one day be able to see the glory of God is Christ living in us. Going back again to what Revelation 14, 12 says, the ones who possess, the ones who have the faith of Jesus, Jesus Christ living in us. Let me see if you are following me. Jesus Christ living in us. Please think about it for a minute or so. We are talking here about the creator of this universe. The God of this entire universe. The powerful God who created us and everything. The Bible here in Colossians 1.7 is saying that this God wants to live in us. 
Can you imagine this mortal sinful body, sinful human being? God, the holy, powerful, righteous God in us. So when this happens, then we are possessing the faith of Jesus. We are keeping because the righteous God, the righteous, perfect Jesus living in me makes me perfect, makes me righteous, makes me holy. And this is a concept that we must reflect upon this because there is a way, according to the Bible here, that we humans can become, or, or better say, be made, because none of us can, on our own efforts, attempt to be righteous, attempt to be perfect, or attempt to be holy. However, when Christ lives in us the hope of glory, then he makes us righteous. He makes us to do the right thing. He makes us holy. He makes us perfect. And then, I'll come back to, to this in a minute. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Then when this righteous God, perfect and holy, powerful God lives in us, notice what we will be able to experience and to say. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ, says the Apostle Paul. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Isn't that the same as Colossians 1.27? Isn't that the same as Revelation 14.12, that keeping the faith of Jesus Possessing Jesus living in me, Paul now repeats the same in Galatians. He's saying, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son who loved me and gave himself for me. Then, when the righteous and perfect Jesus dwells in us, then it's no longer my words, it's no longer my actions, it's no longer my attitude, it's no longer my ways, but all of these change to be the ways and the words and the thoughts of Christ who lives in us. My brothers and sisters, this is the and the center of the third angel's message. And this is the message that we as Seventh-day Adventist people should be knowing and should be preaching today to the world. Because we believe that Jesus is coming very, very soon. But Jesus is coming to take his people with him. But he's coming to take a people who are be, became righteous and holy and perfect. Otherwise, he is not going to take us to live with him forever and ever in eternity. I'll come back to these slides later. So now, in the same idea, please, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. The book of Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, 31, the Apostle Paul tells us how, in a practical way, Christ can live in me. How, in a practical way, Christ can be in me and make me righteous and make me holy and perfect. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31 the Apostle Paul says in there, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have Christ Jesus our Lord 
At the end, the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. What do you mean die daily? Can somebody be dying daily? You die once and you get buried and you don't resurrect it and die, and die tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Well, basically here Paul is talking about in a spiritual aspect that he dies daily. How does Paul die daily? Let's go to Romans chapter 6. See, God willing, you write in those verses because they are key to understand what we believe and who we are. Romans chapter 6 deals with this. Um, many verses in there, but let me read verses 11 and 12. It says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. When Paul says that he dies daily, he is talking about dying to sin. Dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And verse 12 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign. Do not let sin dominate you in your mortal body that you should obey in its last. My brothers and sisters, the practical way how the, the righteous Jesus, the perfect and holy Jesus can live in me is when you and me die to our sins daily. And how do we do that, Pastor? How do we do that? When you and me daily come to the Lord in total, total surrender to him. And we come daily and we give to him our will and everything that we have so we say him lord come and live in me please i don't want to live this life anymore i want you to live in me to take control of my life to possess me and i want to be your slave i want to be your servant and I want that every single thing that comes out of my mouth, out of my actions, whatever it is, may be you, but not me. And this is a daily experience because Paul says that he dies daily. So daily you and me are invited in the third angel's message to obtain the faith of Jesus, his righteousness, his holiness, and perfection, when we daily invite him to live in us, to cleanse us, and to make us holy, to make us righteous, to make us perfect. So when he comes, he takes us to be with him. Hebrews chapter 12. Some of you might be saying or thinking, impossible. Nobody can ever be righteous. It is quite common out there to believe these things that I am only human. And therefore, by saying that, we tend to justify our sins. We tend to justify that it's okay to be living in our sins because nobody is perfect and because we will be sinning until Jesus comes or until I die is the common understanding out there. But we, the people of God, God has entrusted this message to us we, his righteous people, because he lives in us, do not buy this way of thinking. Because notice what, what Hebrews, chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people. Not only pursue peace, but also Hebrews adds, pursue peace with all people and also holiness. See, the invitation here is clearly pursue holiness. You know what? Pursuing holiness is pursuing Jesus. Pursuing holiness is daily asking him to live in me. 
why it is important for us to pursue Jesus and therefore pursue holiness, perfection, and righteousness. Notice the last part of Hebrews chapter 14, verse, sorry, chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. No one will see the Lord if we are not becoming holy, perfect, and righteous. I pray that we are grasping that idea. And let me invite you now to go to 1 John. Notice what the first book of John has to add into this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has been not yet been revealed that we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We shall be like him who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous. For we shall see him as he is. None of us nowadays can see God physically face to face. I had the privilege to be ministering to a particular man in Long Bay Corrective Correctional Center as I worked there as a chaplain yesterday. And he was honestly telling me, I only... I will only believe in God if he, if he comes to talk to me and I can see him face to face and as I can see you and I can hear him the way I can hear you. Other than that, I am not going to believe in God. I explained so many things to him, but we, we hope for the day we can see him. But in order to see a holy God, in order for us to be able to see a holy God, we must be holy first. In order to be able to keep a holy commandment, because the law of God is holy, it says, as the Bible says, in order to keep the holy commandment and possess and obtain and retain, we first must be holy. Let me, let me read verse 3 of First John chapter 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. How about if we go to verse 9 of the First John chapter 3. Notice what the Apostle John says in here. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. When Jesus Christ, seed of God, remains in us. As Colossians 1.27 saying, then you and me will not be sinning, and you and me will be coming righteous and holy and perfect. My brothers and sisters, perhaps you might be asking this question in your heart. Can somebody now be say that he is righteous and holy already? Let me tell you that if somebody comes and say, I have reached and attained, I have rich holiness and perfection and righteousness, this person is boasting. And as, as soon as this person is boasting, he is sinning. And therefore, the righteous Jesus does not live in him. We can say that by the grace of God, he is making us righteous and holy. And you remember, you remember what Philippians 1.6 says. Let's go to Philippians. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this ver very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, the righteous God of this universe who has begun a good work in you, living in us, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. This must be our experience, that we daily die to our sins, that we daily surrender to him, that we daily give him our will, our pride, our selfishness, and all the things that we know separate us from God. Because sin separates us from God. And then going back to Revelation 14, 12. These, those are the saints. And the saints are the ones who do not get the mark of the beast. When we have the faith of Jesus, when Jesus lives in me, when the commandments of God are in me, and then by default I obey the commandments of God because the righteous Jesus makes that possible as he lives in me. And if I obtain and have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God, and then it is impossible that for that particular person might receive the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast is the enforcement to worship a different God. It's an enforcement to worship God in the wrong day, in the wrong time that God has set, since the, set in place since the beginning of this planet that we should worship and revere God on this particular day. Enforcing, worshiping God on the day that God ha the made, man has created, which is the first day of the week, Sunday, the enforcement of that constitutes the mark of the beast. And the seal of God constitutes Jesus living in me, making me holy and righteous, and helping me and enabling me to keep his commandments. Because keeping the commandments of God is the automatically result of having Jesus living in me. But there is Jesus once who said that the commandments of God can be summarized in two. Love God and love your neighbor. You notice nowadays in the whole Christian world and outside that nobody has a problem in terms of keeping the commandments of God unless you show them the fourth commandment. Everybody is okay keeping the first, keeping the second, keeping the third, keeping the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the tenth, the ninth, and the tenth. But when it comes to the fourth, then the common way to say is we are not under the law but under grace when it comes to the fourth commandment the popular belief is we are not under the law we are under grace when it goes to the other commandments things change let me, let me go to this particular aspect as I'm about to finish. I know that I need to finish. Sometimes I don't see the time, and I know that I need to be careful about that. But let me take you to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Because you notice in these verses in there, by the way, Exodus chapter 20 is where the Ten Commandments 
uh, record it, and then we'll go to Deuteronomy as well. Exodus chapter, chapter 20 from verses 1 to 17 talks about the Ten Commandments, but I want to focus on the fourth commandment that is written in there in verse 8, 9, and 10, and 11. It says, it starts with a beautiful word, remember. It's interesting to notice that the only commandment that starts with the word remember is the one that most of Christians are forgetting. And let me be clear as well, in the seventh-day movement, attending church for one hour or two or listening to a sermon on Saturday, on Sabbath for one hour or two, does not constitute keeping the Sabbath holy. Is remember that the Sabbath starts on sunset of Friday and ends on sunset of Saturday. And as remember that this day is not your day, is not my day, but is the Lord's day. And I can read to you what Isaiah says about that, maybe later. But let's check Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Notice that the first part in here is saying that the fourth commandment, if you notice, actually includes the summarization of the Ten Commandments. The Fourth Commandment talks about loving God and loving your neighbor. The third aspect in here that we read from verses 9 to 11 talks about caring for the well-being of somebody else, caring for your neighbor. And notice verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and that is and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice in here that if we are serious in loving God, then we are ought to obey God and see him as the creator. When we come to church and when we greet each other on the Sabbath, as a seven-day Adventist, we used to say, happy Sabbath. But I believe we could also say happy creation day. Because today, the seventh day of the week, we commemorate that we, you and me, have been created. And the Bible says that we have been created fearfully and wonderfully by God. The Sabbath gives us the remembrance of having a God who creates everything. And that talks about the authority of God. But let me take you now to um, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And you see in Deuteronomy chapter 5 another element adding into the fourth commandment that makes that commandment a important one, a one that would be the center of the conflict in the battle between good and evil the center of the conflict at the end of the days, at the end of this world. Chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 5, verse 15. You notice there from verses, um, yeah, the, the whole chapter is, is also the Ten Commandments. Then it goes to verse 15. And remember, when he talks about the, 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 the fourth commandments, in verse 12 says, observe the Sabbath day, but I'll jump to verse 15 when it says, And remember that you were a, a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there by mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. If in Exodus the Lord was saying, Remember the Sabbath because I made you and everything on that day. In Deuteronomy, saying, remember the Sabbath because I have redeemed you. I have made you free using 
the, the analogy of Israel being slaves in Egypt. He says, I deliver you from the hand of the Egyptians, therefore keep this day as a memorial day for that deliverance. But you and me being free and you and me being justified, you and me being excused and exonerated from the penalty of sin by the blood of Jesus. And therefore, you and me be, being free by the sacrifice of Jesus, you and me being redeemed by the faith of Jesus. And therefore, we remember that when the seventh day of the week comes. You notice the seventh day of the week, which is the Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment, is the point of conflict. But if you and me, my brothers and sisters, have the perfect Jesus living in you, living in us, then we will be able to obey the commandments of God, will be able to understand who is our creator, who is our redeemer, will be able to submit and surrender to him and only to him. The mark of the beast goes to the opposite, to say, you should surrender to me, says the beast. Who is the beast is another topic. You should follow me. You should surrender to me. And because I have authority to do that, I'm establishing here another day, not the seventh, but the first week of the day, and therefore you shall do that. And I'll enforce you to do that. And that would be your decision and my decision to see which way are we going to go. Are we going to follow the way of the beast and get his mark but submit ourselves to him? Or we're getting the seal of God by honoring God and his, in his role as a creator and redeemer specified in the fourth commandments as having Jesus living in us and allowing us and enabling us to obey the commandments of God. Let me take you to the few verses as we're about to finish. Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. It's quite common to hear people saying that it's impossible to obey the commandments of God. And most of us call ourselves Christians or sometimes Seventh-day Adventists. And then something is here for us in 2 Timothy 3, Five. Having a form of godliness, thinking that we are godly, thinking that we are following God and the Lord Jesus, but notice, having a form of godliness by denying the power therein, for such turn away. When we believe or we say that we believe in God in Jesus, and then we say, I can't do this. I can't break this habit. I can't leave this sin aside. It controls me. What is happening here is we are denying the power of the righteous God Jesus living in us. We are denying that he is powerful enough to make us holy and righteous. Powerful enough to help us to leave aside our pride, our selfishness, our arrogance, and so many habits and things that we have that shouldn't be there because those are the things that are interfering between me and God. And God is willing and able to come very soon to take his people to live with him forever and I'll finish only with one slide in here. If you put a PowerPoint, please. I can't be able to explain all of this so quickly goes, you can't see that properly perhaps, but this equation that you see now is what happened in the past 
because when Revelation chapter 12, 14 talks about the third angel's message, talks about not worshiping the beast. And this will explain quickly what was the beast in the past. In the past, we need a combination of a religious power, hold by papacy, and then a combination of political power, hold by the Roman Empire, and when these two powers, religion and political, mixed together, that gave birth to a religious political power that constitute the beast that persecuted the people of God back in the darkened ages. From the year 538, from the year 1798, this power has persecuted the people of God and killed about 50 million of our brothers and sisters. And why they persecute the people of God? Because the people of God, the true Christians of the past, were saying to this power, we will not submit to your power. We will keep the commandments of God. We only worship one God and nobody else, and we will keep the Sabbath holy because this is the day of the Lord when we remember him being the creator and the redeemer. And therefore, this power got angry to the faithful Christians and persecuted them for about 2,600 years, prophetic events that we as Adventists, as Seventh-day Adventists know. But and then... There is another movement in here that called Protestantism. Because nearly at the end of this persecution time, Protestantism came into the picture, protesting against this power. The Reformation took place. They protested. Because they protested, they opposed this power. And then is went most of the Christian denominations that we know nowadays started to come forth. We're talking about Anglicans, Baptists, and all of them as the protest movement started, the Reformation movement. And they, all of them, opposed to this particular power. The Seventh-day Adventist movement, the peace in the 1800s. God raised in a special people to preach in a special message there. Because the first angel's message and the second angel's message has its place in 1843 and 1844. And the third angel's message has its important place right now today. This is the equation of the past. And this is the equation for the near future when Revelation 14, 12 says that worship, do not worship the beast and his image or receive the mark. Remember, we read that in Revelation 14, um, sorry, Revelation 14, 9. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead, on his hand, same thing that happened in the past would happen today. Sorry. We need, again, the combination of religious and political power that constitute the image of the beast of the past who had the same power. But in order for religion and political power to come together, we need a religious power here, and we need a, a political power. Who is holding the religious power nowadays? The same that was holding the religious power in the past, the papacy. And I'm not talking here about the faithful Roman Catholic members. The Roman Catholic Members are faithful people who live according to the light that has been given to them. I come from a Catholic country, Catholic continent, and I have a high regard for many of their people for the work they do in order to support and help people in need. The problem in here is the papacy system. And they are the holds the religious power in there. But in order for this religious power to be able to have control and be the image of the beast needs political power. But in the past was the Roman Empire giving them that political power, but now in the near future, Revelation 13 says that this nation, the United States of America, are the ones who are going to give to the papacy the political power that he needs in order to form that beast or image of the beast. And then when this is formed, like in the past, 
persecution and intolerance will happen. And if in the past persecution came because faithful believers of God were faithful to the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God, they, this religious and political power, do not like the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And therefore they persecute or will persecute whoever have, whoever holds, whoever keeps the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. But and then the question is, how about the Protestants that we saw in the past? Unfortunately, many of the Protestants now, they have become apostate Protestants. And you know why? Because many of the Protestants nowadays have laid aside, have ignored have ignored the commandments of God by saying that we are under the law, but not, we're not under the law, but under grace. In a simple way, Romans 6.24 says that sin has no dominion over you, mean sin doesn't control my life. You know, you know when sin can control your life? When we break the law. The law doesn't affect us if we don't break it. When we break it and then affects us. So Romans 6, 24 says, sin doesn't control us because we don't break the law. Because Jesus lives in us and we keep the commandments. We don't break the law, therefore we don't sin. So sin doesn't have dominion over me, doesn't control me. And then Paul says that beautiful sentence. For you are not under the law. You are not under the dominion and the condemnation of the law because we have not breaking the law because Jesus lives in us and therefore we are righteous, holy, and perfect. See, but we are under grace because Jesus comes to live in me by grace. And therefore, I can obey the commandment of God and become holy like him. In this sense, yes, we are not under the law because we do not break the law. But we are under grace because he lives in us. And because many of the Protestant world, and I'm saying Protestant, I'm just mentioning, referring not only to the other denominations, but also to many of us who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, but might not be living according to the third angel's message by keeping the faith of Jesus and the commandment of God. So when they become apostate, when they ignore that, which already they did, rather than opposing this power, like in the past, they were using their influence and strength to support the religious political power. And then, my brothers and sisters, the image of the beast will be formed. And then persecution will come upon us, the ones who keep the faith of Jesus and the ones who have the or keep the commandment of God. May the Lord bless you. I know I took a bit of time, and I apologize for that. However, we need to understand this. And let me finish with one verse, and I'll finish here with, with one verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon in there gives us a beautiful, beautiful ending to his book. If you have read Ecclesiastes, you understand Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, and I'll finish with this when it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And this is the conclusion of the whole matter, my brothers and sisters. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Resemblance of Revelations 14, 12. It's my prayer that you, my brother and sister, and you who are watching this program and listening to this sermon, be able to surrender to God completely, to obtain and possess the faith of Jesus and the commandment of God, and do not receive the mark of the beast, but the seal of God, as we obey his commandments, as we exalt the fourth commandment, being God, the creator and the redeemer. And then we will be Declare by the God of the universe, righteous, holy, and pure, and then will enter the kingdom of heaven, which is the hope of glory that we're always looking for. May the Lord bless each one of you. Let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, your word is beautiful. Your word is holy, Lord, and we are not holy. But Father, you promise in your word that you can make us holy. And we want to be like you. We want to be holy as you are. Father, help us daily to come to you, to live to you our lives, to surrender to you every single thing. We know our own hearts. We know our own mistakes and habits and sins. Please, Heavenly Father, I pray today that you inspire us and helps us to come to you daily, to confess to you, to receive you in us. So Jesus Christ, on behalf of your children, on behalf of the ones who are watching this sermon and listening to this program, Lord, that you come and live in us and change us, Father, and makes us ready to meet you one day. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus, Father, we pray. Amen.